الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Indeed, all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, the sustainer, and controller of all that happens in the universe. And we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger, his family, his companions, and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. These days, Many people are preparing for Hajj. And as we all know, this is uh, one of the pillars of Islam. But in, this, in the performance of this pillar, there are certain objectives that Allah the Exalted wants us to achieve. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran in Surah Al-Hajj, He tells us why we should undertake this journey. You've probably heard from people who have gone for Hajj that it's a journey of a lifetime. And it is indeed a journey of a lifetime. But only for those who go. You see, it doesn't matter how much I tell you about Hajj and about the experiences. At the end of the day, these are all just my experiences my perspective, my feelings, my emotions. So a person cannot really experience his or her personal feelings and emotions unless that person goes there on this journey. And that's why in as much as we pay a lot of money to go for Hajj, this year, you know, some packages are close to $10,000. We're still required to go. Some may think, well, if I'm going to spend that kind of money, why don't I just send the money and, you know, I can stay in, in the comfort of my home and family here. But we're still required to go because Allah wants us to go. As He says in Surah Al-Hajj, لِيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ So that they may witness things that will be of benefit to them. If you don't go, you can't witness these things. You can't see these things. You can't experience them yourselves. And each person, everything that we witness, even if it's the same event, we all have our own personal feelings and emotions and experiences as we experience, even if we're together as a group, the same incident. So Allah says that the reason people should go for Hajj is that they can witness things that will be of benefit to them. If you don't go, you can't witness these things. And what is also interesting about this verse, about this ayah, is that Allah the Exalted did not tell us what are these things we should witness in order to benefit from. He simply says, لِيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ So that they can witness things that will benefit them. What are these things? He didn't tell us. Because he has left it up to the individual to decide what it is he or she will benefit from. So the individual decides how much or how little, or how many or how few incidents in things that he or she will see and experience on this journey that he or she will benefit from. So one person may go and come back with not many things that he or she has really uh, benefited from. And, and others may go and come back with a thousand and one things from which they have, uh, they, they have derived benefit. But we do know there are certain things that we can benefit from, certain common things. For example, the, the Kaaba itself. We as Muslims, we've heard a lot about the Kaaba. We have read about the Kaaba. And Alhamdulillah, these days with the technology, we have seen many images of the Kaaba. But to be able to go there and see the Kaaba with your own eyes is an amazing thing. And again, like I said, no matter how much I tell you, it's just my feelings, how I felt when I saw the Kaaba. Each person has to go to experience those feelings when you see the Kaaba. It's a simple structure, yet it is impressive. And as we know from the Quran, Allah says, Inna awwala bayt wudi'a lil-nasi lal-ladhi bi 
in Surah Ali Imran. Surely the very first house of worship established for mankind on the earth, that is, is the one that is in Bakka. And the word Bakka here is another name for the word Makkah or variation of the word <laughs> Makkah. So this is the first house of worship that was built on the earth for people. According to the, the scholars, it was built by Adam alayhi salam. And then later on it was rebuilt or renovated by Ibrahim alayhi salam. So the Kaaba itself is one of these things of benefit that a person can see. Because you see, we've heard so much about it, we've read so much about it, now we have the chance to see it. To realize that all the stories we've heard of the Kaaba and the, the place it has in Islam, it's real. It's not a made up story. It's not a fabricated story. We have a chance to go and as we say, see the birthplace of Islam, where it all started. So that we know and we are uh, perhaps reinforced in our own faith and belief that Islam is not a a farce. It is not a story that somebody made up and concocted and you know try to sell to the rest of people. We can trace its origins back. We have the maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam that is close to the Kaaba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the maqam in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى And take the station of Abraham or the footprints of Abraham as a place for prayer. And this is why the Prophet alayhi salam when he performed Umrah and he did Tawaf, he prayed two rakats of Nafil prayers behind the Maqam. And the Maqam are basically the footprints of Ibrahim alayhi salam that Allah caused to be embedded in the rock for as a sign for future and later generations. Because as he and Ismail were rebuilding the Kaaba, and as the sides were the walls were getting higher, he had to climb on something to get height. So the rock, one of the rocks he stood on. Allah causes footprints to be embedded in that, and that's what you see. If you're able to go close to it, because the Saudis have encased it in, a, in an enclosure, uh, it's, it has the rough outlines. You won't see it very clearly, like you won't see the outlines of the toes and things like that. You will, but you will see the rough outline of two sets of, or one set of footprints, both feet. This is the maqam of Ibrahim as a sign. When he renovated the Kaaba and rebuilt it, we also have other places like uh, Jabal Nu, the mountain of light. This is the mountain on which is the cave of Hira, in which the Prophet ﷺ used to meditate in before he received revelation. In a hadith in Sahih al Bukhari, Aisha radiallahu anha said that about that as it, as the time grew nearer to the time he would receive revelation from Allah, Hubbiba ilayhi al khala. The Prophet salam sort of just like that began to, to, to like to be alone. Just like that. Suddenly, as at the time got closer to the time he would receive revelation, he would he now loved to be alone. So he would leave his home and he would go up on this mountain, which is about maybe three kilometers from the Haram. And on this mountain there's a cave. And actually, if you go up there. You can see the half if it's not uh, dusty. Of course, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, you probably couldn't see it because the Kaaba was a little structure in the, in the middle of the valley floor. Now you can see the minarets of the Haram in Mecca if you go up on the, on the mountain. But he used to go there and he used to sit down in, you know, all alone in the, in the solitude and the peace and, and as we say, serenity of the, of the place. And he would meditate and he, he would think because he was always worried about the trends in society. And he knew instinctively, and, and you know, through common sense as we say, that many of the things that the people were doing and embraced as lifestyles were wrong. But the Prophet ﷺ had no answer. He didn't know what to do. So he would, as it got closer to the time that he would receive revelation, he would go on this, on this mountain in this cave and sit down and just think and be away from the people and the society. And then one night in the same mountain, in the same cave, it all happened. When Jibra'il alayhi salam appeared in his true form as an angel, and he hugged the Prophet alayhi salam and squeezed him very tightly, 
in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet والسلام, said, Hatta balagha minni al-juhud, until I could not bear it anymore. And then the angel released him and said to him, read, iqra. And he said to the angel, ma ana biqari, I don't know how to read, I'm not, I can't read. And the angel hugged him a second time. And then released him and said to him, read. And again, he, he, he gave the same reply, I don't know to read. And then the angel hugged him a third time and released him. And then the angel recited the verses of the Quran in Surah Al-Alaq that Allah revealed these first five verses. So when you go for Hajj, this is one of the things you have an opportunity to see. So that you know that this is where it all began. Although the mountain does not have any religious significance, it has no religious significance. It has perhaps only historical significance. But nevertheless, it serves to give one conviction and peace of mind. That I know this is real, this is true, because here is the mountain, here is the cave. I can tell you these days, brothers and sisters, that the cave has actually become a major tourist attraction during Hajj time. A lot of people go up there and they crowd the cave and they want to pray in the cave, but there is no sunnah for this. The Prophet ﷺ did not revisit the cave after he received the first revelation. So there's no religious significance. But it connects one with the history to know that this is where it all started. So that is something else that a person has the chance to witness as well. Then there is what is known as Jabal al-Rahmah in, in Arafat, in the plains of Arafat. If you go for Hajj, you will notice Arafat is a huge open land. It has a lot, of, a lot of hills within. But it has no buildings, nobody lives there. Yet, for one day of the year, that place becomes the best place to be in the whole world. Ibn Taymiyyah, in discussing the issue of what days and what nights are the best days and nights, he said when it comes to daylight hours, the best day of the entire year, including the days of Ramadan, is the day of Arafat, when the Hujjad stand in the plains of Arafat during Hajj. In Arafat, there is a little hill and there is a pillar on it. And it is known as Jabal al-Rahmah, the mountain of mercy. <laughs> Some of the historians, the scholars say that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down Adam and Eve from heaven, from paradise, they were split up. They didn't find themselves together on the earth. So they were all alone. And of course, the earth would have been a very strange place for each one. And they could remember, you know, the closeness and the companionship they had in Jannah before. So they began to search for each other. And according to the scholars, they, they found each other in Arafah. And that's how the place got the name Arafah. Because when one saw the other, he said, Araftuka, I know you, I recognize you. And the word Arafah comes from the Arabic verb Arafah, to know, to have knowledge of, or to recognize. And then, remember, they had disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he ordered them not to come near or to eat from a particular tree. And they disobeyed that order through, of course, the temptations of shaitan. And here is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught them how to ask for forgiveness. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِن رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتِ And Adam received from his Lord certain words. Certain words, فَتَابَ alay, And he turned to him with, with forgiveness. إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ For surely he is the all-forgiving, the most merciful. So these words, the scholars say, the Mufassirun say, these words are the dua of how to ask for forgiveness. And that dua is in the Quran as well. Rabbana, inna zalamna anfusana, Rabbana zalamna anfusana, wa in lam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lana kunanna min al khasirin. These are the words Allah taught him and he, he recited them and prayed for forgiveness. And so Allah forgave them, forgave him and her. Because in, in that verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, at the very beginning, Allah says, فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّي كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ Adam received these words from his Lord, and he, meaning Allah, turned to him with his forgiveness, because he prayed for forgiveness. Unlike Iblis, by the way. 
When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offered him please the chance to make amends and ask for forgiveness, he didn't ask. Instead, he demonstrated his arrogance and his pride. So when Allah says to him, O oh, Iblis, what prevented you from prostrating when I commanded you? This was his chance to say, Oh Lord, I made a mistake, I slipped up, forgive me. But he didn't. Instead, he said to Allah, I couldn't bring myself to prostrate to him because you created him from, from clay and you created me from fire. I'm better than him. But when Allah gave the same chance to Adam, Adam alayhi salam was remorseful and he repented, so Allah forgave him. It is said this is the spot where this forgiveness was given to them. That's hence the name of the hill, Jabal al-Rahma, the mountain of mercy. Witnessing Muzdalifah itself, in which in the Quran, Allah refers to it as al-Mash'ar al-Haram. You know, going to Medina, visiting the Masjid of the Prophet والسلام, visiting Masjid Quba, the first Masjid that was ever built in Islam. When the Prophet migrated, he spent about a week in Quba. Before he came into Medina itself, he built, his, he built a masjid there that is known as Masjid Quba. And the Prophet himself, every, uh, usually on Saturdays, would either walk or ride an animal to Quba and pray and come back. Like mid-morning, he would go pray in the masjid, nafil prayers and come back. And he said in the hadith that if anyone performs wudu at home and then goes to Masjid Quba and prays two rakats of nafil in it, in this masjid, the reward would be as having performed an Umrah. So there's the Prophet, and there's a Prophet Masjid as well, about which the Prophet said, a prayer in my Masjid is a thousand times better than anywhere else, except in Mecca. Seeing the Masjid, seeing the house area, knowing that these things are real. It's not a story that someone came up with, but the place is there and everything is there. Being able to go to, the, to Uhud, the mountain of Uhud where the battle took place. To pass by the area where the trench was dug during the battle of Al-Khandaq. So these are all things that a person can witness and benefit from. But besides this, there are other things, experiences. You might see people doing things or, 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 or you know, behaving in a certain way. These are all things that we benefit from. So this is why it is important for us to undertake the journey for Hajj. Now I know on a practical level today, it might be too late to, to decide to go for Hajj this year. Because preparations you know, start months before, groups are usually big to, booked way in advance. Um, <clears throat> right now, I know Dar es Salaam, for example, they're on the verge of handing in the pass, submitting the passports and the documents for visa at the Saudi Embassy. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it is important for us brothers and sisters as Muslims to think about Hajj and to plan for Hajj. Not just to say one of these days I will go for Hajj. We need to plan for Hajj. Because it takes planning. It takes, you know, you have to amass a significant amount of money, at least 10,000. You have to think of your own family. Are you taking them with you or are you leaving them behind? If you're taking them, well, you, have, you need more finances. If you're leaving them behind, you know, you have to think about their well-being, their security, their safety. So it, takes, it needs planning. If a sister wants to go, she just cannot up and go, she needs a mahram. So, a lot of planning needs to happen so that the mahram is ready when the sister is ready. He's available. Often sisters are ready, the mahram is not ready. So the sister finds herself in a bind in that she is ready for hajj, but the mahram has all kinds of excuses. So we need to talk about these things and we need to start planning so that we should, uh, as, as, as earliest as possible, undertake this journey to fulfill this pillar of Islam. Of course, there are certain conditions in terms of financial ability and, and, and security and so on, and, and, and uh, health, which may render many people unable to perform hajj. And these are valid reasons, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not hold it against a person who has a valid reason for not being able to make the journey. But for those who have the ability, financial and otherwise, and they procrastinate and delay, they have no excuse or justification. And this is why Al-Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, he holds the opinion that once a person meets the requirements for Hajj, then the very next Hajj season that comes along, that person is obliged to go for Hajj. You cannot choose to delay until the following year or the year after. There's no delaying this. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He help us to begin to plan 
if you haven't already performed Hajj, plan with your families uh, for Hajj. May He make it easy for all of us be uh, be able to have the opportunity to go for Hajj. And may He take our brothers and sisters who are going for Hajj safely and bring them back safely and accept from them their Hajj. May He open up our hearts and minds also that we can understand this message. And may He inspire us to live by this message. Aqulu qawli hadha. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.